heartland of the U.S. We're just a few miles away from the big Walmart uh, corporate office. Uh, you may have heard of Walmart, but yep. uh, I'm just uh, tongue-in-cheek there, obviously. But tonight's program merges amateur radio with high-altitude ballooning. Our speaker is Fred Kemmerer, Alpha Bravo One Oscar Charlie. Fred is president of the Nashua, New Hampshire Amateur Radio Society, which is special for several reasons. It's a large club with more than 200 members, and that's remarkable in and of itself for a city in far southern New Hampshire, northwest of, um, of Boston. And uh, Nashua, apparently, according to my research, Fred, is about the size of Fayetteville, Arkansas, just down the road from us where the University of Arkansas is located. Uh, Nashua is also often listed as one of the best places to live in the U.S. Earlier in the year, the Nashua Club was designated the Dayton Hamvention's 2019 Amateur Radio Club of the Year. The why and how of that award will be the subject of another program as Fred has agreed to come back and speak with us about that in early 2020. By the way, that picture there is a shot taken from one of our, our first half flight at over 90,000 feet. So um, you're gonna get some pretty amazing stuff out of this, of this project. And in fact, we proved yet again that the earth is actually not flat, but round, which is good. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we were trying to do with this. Um, I'm going to spend a little time on how we made this a STEM learning experience for schools, because that's really the reason that we did this. Um, we've gotten pretty good at flight planning. Now, here in New England, this is a tricky deal, because if we mess up, our balloon ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. So flight planning and engaging when we are in, in a position where we can launch and not lose the thing is pretty important. Now, you all are probably going to have an easier time with that, but it's still a good idea to figure out where your balloon is going to come down. And I'm going to show you how to do that fairly accurately. Um, we're going to look at some of the flight paths. We're going to talk about what this is like in New England. And we're going to, the best part is we're going to show you some videos of some of our launches and, and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll, we'll share what we learned the hard way. All right, so we originally created this project as a meaningful way to get kids in schools, high schools initially, and then middle schools now as well, interested in doing amateur radio. Um, we've developed along with some local teachers, a 12 hour classroom program that we use to teach the kids everything that goes into high altitude ballooning. I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that. Um, we have a, a, a platform, mostly from commercial parts, that's very lightweight, that the kids basically do a little engineering project to program the flight for. They take their balloon out, prep it, launch it, track it, get the data from, from the onboard flight computer, and then they kind of do a, a science report on what they learn. Um, we've been consistently flying over 115,000 feet or 20, 21 plus miles with these things, which is about as high as you can go with an unsheathed balloon. Um, it carries a parachute, so it doesn't come crashing back down to earth. We've, we've done four flights successfully, and I still have a working half, which is, is a small miracle in itself. Um, the thing carries um, an onboard APRS radio transmitter on two meters. And that's particularly advantageous because all of the APRS ground stations, DigiPeters, and iGates track this thing. So we have a huge nationwide tracking network that's built in. And all the kids really need to see where it is is a web browser and to go to APRS FI. So the, the whole tracking element, and the coolest part of this is we actually track this thing while it flies. And the kids kind of can see as it's flying, you know, how high it is and what the temperature is and whether it's following the flight path they thought it would, where it's gonna land. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting between the launch and the recovery. We fly with onboard video cameras and you're gonna see some of those pictures and videos as we go. Um, we also fly, fly with the GPS, a temperature and a pressure sensor. All that data is recorded by the flight computer and also sent to the ground in real time via APRS. 
And so what the kids do basically is they learn about the technology, they plan the flight, um, including, you know, deciding how much helium we put in and when we launch and all that kind of stuff. Um, there have been some work on some science experiments that the kids had developed. I'll talk a little bit about that. They test the payload, they launch, track, and recover, they analyze the results. And along the way, we teach them a lot about amateur radio and do lots of other amateur radio stuff. So it, all in all, while this is a really cool technical thing to do as an amateur radio person, the real value is it's a pretty high quality educational experience for schools. So these are some of the schools that we work with, um, two local high schools and two basically local middle schools. Um, and uh, we've had multiple have engagements with all of these folks. The, the folks at Hudson Memorial, the teachers there, they were our, our first big middle school. They've actually taken over the program and two teachers are using their dedicated classroom time for science classes. Uh, for two and a half hours every week to teach this with us sitting in the room, you know, in case they get a hard question. Um, we always do hands-on activities. You can see in the lower left, the young man there has one of our go kits and he's learning about how to make repeater contacts. We do fox hunts with the kids. We build, um, we do handheld satellite contacts. We bring in a remote HF station. So pretty much if we do two and a half hours, at least an hour of every one of those classroom sessions is some amateur radio activity that's part of the process. And uh, you can see the kids all uh, poised there with an upper two with their, with their habs there as they're getting ready to launch them. We'll, we'll look at all the hardware as we go, but it's been a pretty good project. I would say all in, we've maybe touched, well, two combined classes in the lower left school, that might be 60 or 70 kids there um three classes in the lower left that might be another 40 or 50. um the school in the upper right probably 25 and bishop girton we probably touched 30 or 40. so all in we probably exposed maybe 100 students or a little more than that to to amateur radio through this project so it's been really good that way um the the thing that really made this work for us was the help we've gotten from local teachers to kind of develop a quality learning program we had some idea of what we wanted to cover but we really let these folks the upper two folk uh student our teachers eleni and karen are high school teachers um the other three are our middle school crowd um and uh, they've really done an excellent job of helping us develop a real quality educational program. The two high school teachers helped us do it initially, and then the middle school teachers helped us adapt it to a different age group of kids, which of course is important. Um, and also by getting these folks, you can see quite a few of them, actually three of the five, these five teachers are now licensed. Dan, the upper right, has his extra. Karen has her general, and Adam has a tech. Um, they've also become natural kind of role models um, and advocates for STEM learning in, in this, around amateur radio schools. Dan and Adam are, not, is a, are about to form an amateur radio club in their school and, and really go all out on amateur radio. And Dan is also attending some national level con teachers conferences and advocating amateur radio as a STEM learning tool in classrooms around, this, around the, the United States. So the investment that we made in what looked like it would be a fun technical project, and it really was, it is, had paid some dividends here that we never expected. And a lot of that goes to the credit of the people on this, on this chart. All right, so I got one more slide on education, and then we're gonna get to the fun stuff, but this is really the reason that we're doing this, so it's pretty important. This is an outline that is a kind of an engineer's rendering of how we teach this. So I apologize if there's a real teacher in the audience, I know you're rolling your eyes now. But on the fundamentals, we teach three things. We teach flight physics, which is all about how gravity, buoyancy, and all of that kind of stuff works and why the balloon does what it does. We teach atmospheric science about, you know, what happens with temperature and pressure as you go up in the atmosphere, how the jet, jet stream does, how it works, um, how it actually looks. So we kind of look at real data. And then we do a lot around what we call terminal physics, which is all about the operation of the parachute and the landing. And so 
that's kind of the core of what I call the basic physics curriculum that, that gets taught around this, which is one of the things that reason that the teachers like it and they can see themselves substituting it for what they would teach on their own. You know, schools nowadays really want to focus on teaching stuff that is practical. And, you know, this is kind of a pretty practical application for a lot of, you know, math, science and physics stuff that normally is pretty abstract at this level. So that's the draw. Um, we also teach about radio telemetry and how sensors work. Um, we kind of go through the whole launch preparation process, including teaching the kids how to file a flight plan. Um, we teach a piece on space communications, which is a great entree into a tech license, among other things. And then you can see the stuff on the side that the kids do around, you know, the actual hands-on part of the project. So a couple cool things that happen um, that we can teach about. We, you can see there's a diagram on the left of the layers of the atmosphere, and you can see about how high we go, you know, to sort of the 21, 22 mile level. So through the troposphere and a good portion of the uh, stratosphere. And one of the interesting things that happens, you know, the temp pressure goes down and we measure that as we go up to almost um, uh, non-existent numbers. But the interesting thing is temperature does some weird stuff. Um, it drops until you get through the troposphere, then it levels off, and it actually starts to go back up again. That flattening out part is something called the tropophase. And um, we kind of teach why that happens, and, and, you know, and then the, the students go out and measure it with the actual balloon. So it takes what otherwise is a pretty set of, of acetyric physics and science context, uh, concepts and actually lets them measure it to see that it's real. So, you know, there's a little bit of a science slash engineering kind of learning project behind this, which is one of the things that makes it practical and attractive. Um, another element now, I'm gonna to come to this in a bit when we talk about the equipment. This thing is light enough that we don't need any FAA permission and we don't even need to file a flight plan. Mm -hmm. um, we file a flight plan anyway for safety um, we have a pretty high density of private airports that are in our area here. And um, and so we decided, well, if we have to follow a flight plan anyway, we're going to teach the kids how to do it. Now, I don't know if any of you all are, are pilots, but if you are, are, you probably know this is kind of an antiquated way of doing this using VORs. Most people file flight plans using GPS stuff nowadays. But what we actually do is we get a VOR map out and we go through the whole process of how one files a flight plan for a high altitude balloon using VOR data. And then, uh, you know, we go ahead and call the FAA. The FAA has screens for high weather balloons in it. That's something they don't see a lot of, but they're set up to handle it. And we go ahead and file the flight plan. When we have flights that go down towards Boston, where you know we get near a big airport. I've actually been on the phone with flight controllers right before launch, just letting them know, you know, hey, we're going to launch, and here's the wind conditions we see here, and is the airspace clear? So we're pretty careful. Now we don't have to do any of this stuff, but it's you know it's just good, solid safety practice. It's not hard to do, and it's actually a pretty nice learning experience for the kids. Um, the other thing that we always do with these deals is we hold an open house at usually at my place here and we let the kids come out We do a fox hunt. We let them play with all the amateur radio equipment, get on the air. We usually do satellite contacts and we try to make a lot of the amateur radio stuff that we talked about, particularly the space elements kind of real for them. Um, we've actually had a cake. Um, the, one of these we did after their launch, we had a nice picture of the kids launching their balloons. So my wife actually had it stenciled on a cake for them, which was pretty cool. But what we try to do with all this is we try to make the amateur radio part of this a lot of fun. And as a result of this, we've actually gotten quite a few of these kids licensed. If you look at that picture on the left there, every single person in that picture, this was one of the Bishop Girton groups, including the teacher, all have tech licenses or better. So that, you know, it's a good opportunity for you all to, to recruit some young people if you want to do that. All right, so let's get into the hardware. So 
you all probably have seen pictures of foam ice chests and, and all these contraptions that people build. Um, we take a very different approach. And most of our approach is designed to keep the weight down. So our actual hab platform is in the upper right. It's made of um, a wood that's a lightweight. It's almost like a high strength balsa wood. Um, and it's built about like you would build a model airplane. It's maybe, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet on a side. Um, it, it, we modified it a bit. Those, those, um, when you, when you go flying balloons in New England, we have a lot of water here. Probably not a problem. You have so much in Arkansas, maybe like we do, but those are insulating pipes that you, for, for insulating heat pipes that you get at Home Depot, you know, when you want to like lower your heating, but you go and hang them all, all the pipes in your basement. Turns out that makes the hab float, which is a really good thing. And you'll see at the end why that's a really good thing. Um, you can see the different components. I'll go over all those pieces in detail that are attached to GoPro cameras, um, the flight computer in the upper right. We run a backup a GPS that, that is uh, in addition to APRS, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Also, there's a sounder that makes a really annoying beeping noise, which we turn on right before we launch it, and that turns out to be very important when you're trucking through the woods trying to find your hab that you know you're within a couple hundred yards of. Mm -hmm. On the lower right is the parachute. We typically, for this weight platform, use a parachute that's about three feet in diameter. And the key to doing this successfully is to rigging a proper flight line. So the picture on the left is actually our hab right after takeoff. And you can see the flight platform hanging there at the bottom. That little thing dangling down with it is the two-meter APRS transmitter. And that has a full-size two-meter dipole on it. And then we have 20 feet, a very lightweight, very strong cord between the flight platform and the parachute. And then we have another 20 feet between the parachute and the balloon. So the whole flight line is about 40 feet long. And the reason that's important, and you'll see this in the video, is when that balloon bursts, it is a very violent release of energy because there's a lot of, that balloon is stretched over 30 feet in diameter when it bursts and all that pent up energy in the uh, nylon or in the or the um, the uh, latex in the balloon is all released at once, and it tends to, to tangle everything up. So if you don't separate the pieces, what tends to happen is everything the parachute, the balloon fragments, and the the platform all get tangled up, and you're instead of descending at a nice smooth 10 or 12 miles an hour, your your hab hits the ground somewhere at about 45 or 50. And that's grounds for picking your hab up with a dustpan. So you really don't want that to happen. So this flight line rigging thing is pretty important to do properly. Okay. So here's some stuff on the balloons. We use commercial weather balloons. Now, these things are fairly readily available. Um, they come in different sizes. The starter ones are usually about 750 gram balloons, which is what the balloon weighs. We have recently been, and the pictures here are the 750 gram ones. We've recently been flying with 1500 gram balloons, which is how we're achieving some of these really high altitudes that we're getting. If you're in a calm space, you could probably afford to fly a big balloon right off the bat. The real reason to start out with a smaller one is twofold. First of all, it takes less helium, so it's less expensive to fly. But in windy conditions, um, this thing is about six to eight feet in diameter on the ground, and it can be a handful if the winds get much above about 10 miles an hour. So it's probably smart the first time you do this to start with a little bit smaller size balloon. So if you get in some wind, and I, you know, I've spent some time out in your part of the country, um, I know it can get kind of windy out there at times. Um, that you you can kind of learn to deal with that um, before you you know you have a monster on your. The picture on the right um, is somebody with a leaf blower kind of blowing one of these up almost to bursting and you can see it grows quite a lot um, before it bursts. Okay. Um, these are pictures of the stuff that are on the three corners of the flight platform. On the upper right are two commercial GoPro cameras. Uh, GoPro cameras have quite a range of battery life and these flights can be a normal one will be about two to two and a half hours. 
um, and they can run much longer than that. So it's important to get GoPros that have really strong battery life. Now you can beef some of this up with better than stock batteries, but the GoPros that you really want, I think are the Hero 3s. Um, they're not sold anymore, but you could pick them up on eBay. Um, you probably want a uh, moisture resistant housing like you use for diving for a couple reasons. Not the least of which is you got to have these things dry or they'll fog up in the cold temperatures and of course ruin your video. But more importantly, your biggest challenge is to keep these things warm enough that they don't shut off. They're, these are consumer temperature range rated, rated devices. And as you'll see, you're going to see some pretty cold temperatures. And so the case helps to keep the heat in. We've actually built supplementary insulation around that, but anything you can do to keep the camera lens out of the moisture in dry conditions, and then to keep it insulated is important. The upper left is the flight computer. Now this is a commercial board that we purchased as part of a kit. Although I guess you could probably build one of these if you wanted to. Our focus was STEM learning, not um, construction. And uh, we were actually, Thanks to the generosity of members, we were able to raise a couple thousand dollars to fund this work pretty easily. So we decided to go commercial and focus on the, our work on the classroom part. But these are all mil spec temperature components. And the interesting thing about this is that GPS chip on there is unlocked, which means it works right up to the edge of space. Most GPS circuits are crippled to not work above about 40,000 feet because we don't, the government doesn't really want people doing GPS stuff up at those high altitudes for a lot of good sort of national security reasons. Somehow the company that supplies this computer has gotten a supply of unlocked GPS chips. This thing also has um, a flash card on it. It runs off of four lithium uh, AA batteries that are attached underneath that, uh, that thing that it's sitting on. And uh, it also takes plugins to sensors. You can sort of see in the upper corner here is the temperature and pressure sensor that allows the computer to record that data as it flies. Um, the APRS transmitter, there's kind of a newer version of this that doesn't do quite as much, but we fortunately have one of the older ones. It's basically a two meter, I think it's 50 or 100 milliwatt transmitter with a full size two meter dipole on it that kind of dangles down over the edge of the platform. And uh, when this thing flies, literally ground stations as far south of us as Pennsylvania, which is probably, oh God, three, 400 miles from where we're, the thing is at, hear this thing. Um, as a matter of fact, what APRS of I actually gets a little upset because so many stations are reporting the data from it at once that it gets a little overloaded. Now the flight computer we fly, uh, for those of you guys who might know about APS, you know there's something called a wide setting that controls how many times the packets are repeated by ground stations when, once they're received. The flight computer is smart and uses the altitude data to gauge the wide setting and turn it down as the thing gets higher to the point where the, the packets aren't repeated anymore. But at 90,000 feet, line of sight with a 100 milliwatt or 50 milliwatt two meter transmitter on a full size dipole pretty much anything within line of sight and that's a big footprint are going to hear this thing which is why you know APRS of I gets excited the problem with APRS is it works great down to about 500 feet and then the, it gets too low for the ground stations to pick it up so that last minute to a minute and a half of the flight is probably not going to be recorded by APRS. And of course, you need that data to find your HAB. So as a backup, we file a commercial satellite. We fly a commercial satellite tracker. This is the kind of thing you'd hide in your car or your boat if you were worried somebody was going to swipe it and you needed to track it down. That's kind of what they're made for. Hikers use these things a lot. And this thing will work when the HAB is sitting on the ground. It actually relays its position up through satellites. And this makes it pretty much dead on to find out exactly where your hab is at. We pull them out of trees, out of ponds, all kinds of places. I'll show you some more pictures of that and we've not lost it yet. So these are the basic hardware. You can see this is all really lightweight stuff. Um, so one of the challenges you have is deciding how much helium to put in your balloon um, and where your balloon is going to go. 
There are some pretty good online calculators that you can, like for example, if you weigh your platform very carefully, and this is super important that you have really accurate, like for the gram weights, um, you can put that information in, you can put it the, the you know, size of your balloon, and you can look at different amounts of helium, and it will tell you fairly precisely at what altitude your balloon will burst at and how long it will take to get there. And then there are other other um, tables that are out there that will tell you for a given size parachute at a starting altitude how long it's going to take your head to come back to the ground. The reason that data is important is you can make your flight last literally as long as you want, but the trick is your GoPro batteries are only good for two or two and a half hours. So if you want to have um, a full amount of video, your problem becomes how high can I go to keep the total duration of the flight within the battery width. And that's actually a good engineering challenge for your students to figure out, you know, knowing that they've got those constraints and knowing what the have weighs. Um, and it's a little different every time. Sometimes we, we've flown like radiation badges because the kids wanted to see if there was any exposure in the stratosphere and other stuff. One of our, our teachers is looking at putting a Petri dish with some bacteria on it to see if, the, if, the, if it survives the flight. So we occasionally have, you know, sort of science experiments that are flying with this thing. As long as they're lightweight, they're, that's cool. And so once you have that data, you know how high it goes. There are other calculators that will, about a week or so before the flight, have a good enough model for the jet stream that they can tell you exactly where your hab is going to land. And they're pretty, they're pretty accurate. Now I'll show you some data that actually compares the predictions to real flight data. The way we, be, it's not perfect, but it's good enough to keep us out of the ocean. So we can tell when we're about to launch this thing if we're going swimming or if we're going to put her down in the middle of Boston where we don't want to land. And the way we handle that data is we actually will tell the school, hey, we're going to have flight windows for the next three weekends, just like NASA has launch windows. And we'll go and look at the jet stream, you know, as sort of a countdown up to about two days before the launch and we'll make a final kind of go, no go decision on whether we got a clear launch site. Now, given where you all are, you probably have less cities to worry about, or you have some of those, and you sure have a heck of a lot less water to worry about than we do. So you probably will be a lot less constrained. Um, the other thing to look at is you wanna make sure you don't put this down somewhere you can't get to. We have some pretty rural areas north of us here in New Hampshire where you have to be a mountain climber and on foot for hours to get to. So we also look at our flight paths relative to ending up in one of those spaces, and those are also grounds for us to scrub a launch. Now, the kids actually and the teachers will really get into this if you do it right, because, they, you know, it's kind of like a NASA launch thing, right? Where, like it was back in the 60s where there were like a million things and they needed you know, a couple tries sometimes to get these things to go. If you kind of couch it that way, it can actually be kind of fun. So but these calculators, they do require you have very accurate weights for your platform and you know exactly how much helium you put in the balloon. And the way you do that, can, can you guys see this bottle? Yeah. Yes. yes. This is a NASA approved helium inflation device. It's a bottle full of water. You can see on here we have the weight of our balloon. We have the payload weight to 10 grams. We have how much positive lift our balloon calculator has in it. And then and so we need a total amount of lift when we're inflating the balloon balloon of in this case 2090 grams. So we, you'll see this in the videos. We actually hang this on the inflator and we inflate the balloon till it just lifts this off the ground. And that's how we know exactly how much helium we have in the balloon and we're right. Now we, before every flight, we reweigh this and we make sure it's got the right amount of water on the actual inflator. So we're pretty accurate about, you know, that this thing is really measuring what we think it is. But this is a really simple way to make sure your, your helium inflation is what you think it was in your calculator. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna show you some pictures of these calculators. This is the balloon calculator that we use. It's, it's um, readily available online. And what you do is you put in your launch location and your launch altitude. You put in the time you're gonna launch and the date, your ascent rate, um, your burst altitude, and that comes from a different calculator. 
and then your predicted descent rate. And this thing will actually predict the actual flight path based on jet stream forecasts. And they're pretty good here about two days before we launch. So we start running these as soon as we have jet stream data for the date, which is I think seven or eight days before we launch that you could get the data in the calculator. And we keep running predictions and see where this puppy is gonna go. And then based on that, we get something like this. This was, I believe, HAB, I think this one was HAB 2. Yeah, this is HAB 2. And you can see, here's the ocean. <laughs> this is the thing we're trying to avoid. Up here are the places where you have to be a mountain climber to get your HAB back. Down here is Boston and all the population around it. So we got a lot of stuff to avoid here. This is a school out in the western part of New Hampshire, an elementary school that's got a nice open sports field where we can launch safely. And on this particular launch, you can see that it predicted that we were going to go um, some, I don't know, 86 and a half kilometers, which I don't know, what's that, about 70 miles maybe from start to finish. Our burst was going to be just over the state capitol. And... Um, you know, this was gonna be the descent profile here. So these calculators will give you pretty detailed views. Now this data will vary wildly as you, you know, when you're far out, just like any other weather, it's based on a weather forecast of the jet stream. And those things are not very accurate seven or eight days in advance, but by two days in advance, we found that the length of the flight may be longer. And some of that is we're still getting our weights and everything else fully calibrated. But the shape of the path, the direction, and the rough landing zone are going to be pretty good if you use this thing and put good data into it. Okay. Um, so when you fly, what do you get? Well, your flight computer, and the, and the thing at the bottom there is actual data out of the uh, flashcard from, from our flight computer during a ground test. And you can see what you got here. You've got your date and time off the GPS. You've got the exact latitude and longitude where the reading was taken. Um, like any other GPS system, it compares rings and gives you a heading. It will tell you your ground speed. Now we're doing this sitting on my deck, so we're not moving. It will give you an accurate altitude. This is a flag that tells you when you have lock. Your temperature in, in degrees centigrade and your pressure in pascals, which um, is basically, I think, what would it be? 100,000 pascals is one millibar, which is ground level. So this is how we know all of the data that our balloon is experiencing as it flies. And the APRS system sends all of this to the ground. Mm -hmm. So even if we were to lose this, APRS FI is recording these samples every minute. The flight computer actually records one every 20 seconds. And even if we lost the thing, we'd lose the video, but we would still have our flight data. Okay. So, and you know, this is a great way, the APRS piece is the way the amateur radio ties in directly. But again, if you want to use this as a way to teach kids about fox hunting and Morse code and HF and satellites and all that, you know, you have lots of good entree once you're in the classroom to do those things. So do any of you guys do anything with APRS? Do any of you have a DigiPeter or an iGate or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. So one of the things you can do if you fly one of these is set your eye gate up to record the data. Um, I run an eye gate here, um, and uh, I made a video. I think this was HAB. This was HAB one. I think I'm going to do here. Um, yeah, this is HAB one. You can see that it's going to start out um, with the HAB launched in um, in our our site out in western uh, New Hampshire, and it's going to kind of take a, a jog down here to central Massachusetts hang out by the jet stream, um, at, you know, because once it gets above a certain height, there's no air anymore, so it just kind of hangs out until it gets high enough to burst, and then descend into Rhode Island. This was our longest flight. I think this thing went like 150 miles. We didn't put near enough helium in the balloon, so the flight took like four hours. And uh, as a result, it took quite a hike. Um, what the video is going to illustrate, for those of you who haven't seen an ID, these are all the call signs that I'm hearing in the process, and you'll see the HAB popping up. This is a zoom in on the HAB itself as it flies, and you'll be able, if you can read it, I know it's small, see the altitude and the direction and the speed and all that. And these yellow paths show the path that the APRS packets are, are following through the ground station. 
So in this particular one, which was actually, it looks like a mobile or something, went, was heard up to a, a, a digipeter in northern New Hampshire, relayed down to another digipeter in central Massachusetts, and then I heard it at my eye gate um, at home. So you can sort of see how the APRS network works. The video is going to freeze in two spots, one where I heard the hab directly and one where there was a packet relayed through a station in, in Boston. So at any rate, this is sped up. You're going to see about four hours worth of hab flying in less than a minute here. And it'll give you some idea how the APRS works. So here we go. So there's the hab we just launched. You can see 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 feet. We're headed southeast at about 20 miles an hour. Now somewhere here at around, oh, I don't know, 30,000 feet, we're gonna get in the jet stream. Watch the ground speed jump up. We're at 30 mile an hour, 31, 36. There's a direct hit on my uh, eye gate. There's a relay packet through Boston. We're still going up, 30,000, 35,000, 45 miles an hour ground speed, 40,000, almost 50 miles an hour at times, 50,000, we're starting to get out of the jet stream now, we're slowing down. Most of this is momentum that the balloon already has. Right about here is where we stalled, we're at uh, 65, 70,000, 75,000, 80,000, 85,000. We're going to burst at a little over 90. 91, there's burst. Now watch how fast the descent goes. Not too much movement till we're down. We're already down to 40,000, and uh, that was it. Um, the descent goes very, very quick compared to the ascent sign. So you can see that um, one, the obvious amateur radio piece of this um, is the, the tracking station. You know, you can use the opportunity to teach the kids about how all this stuff works, which they're going to really enjoy. So your students will get lots of good data back, um, some of it during the flight. But this is um, one of the schools did a really nice sort of school report with their data. We helped them plot it out out using Excel. And you can see this was HAB2. Um, you can see the temperature dip down to about minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty friggin' cold. You can see the tropo phase here where you get that flattening out and the temperature goes back um, almost to freezing again at first. And then on the descent, which goes much faster, it dips even lower. We were at minus 70 here. Now, this particular flight was before we started insulating the GoPros, and you can see they shut off right here. And once they stop, they don't restart. The flight computer for fortunately kept going. Our burst on this flight was almost at 118,000 feet, which was pretty high. And so one of the things that the students, they had a prediction of what this thing was gonna do. This was unexpected, so they had a science exercise to do to explain what happened and what we could learn from it and come up with some ideas of what we do to fix it. So you kind of see how the, the science part works. This is some more data. Um, the, the flight calculator that does the ascent assumes a linear ascent as its model. You can see that's actually a pretty good approximation of what actually happens. Um, the air gets thinner. Um, but the uh, resistance to rise slows down at about the same rate. So the net is almost a linear rise rate right up to the burst point, which actually is not intuitive and actually surprised not only the kids, but their teachers too. Um, another key thing is because we have good data and we're in almost a vacuum, we can almost measure the acceleration due to gravity without wind resistance right after this thing bursts. Now there is some, still some error, and you'll see that in the burst video I'm going to show you but it's close enough to the acceleration of gravity compared to the ground that that makes for a great educational discussion as well. Um, you can also see what the ground speed is when you're in the jet stream and you can kind of ask the question, well, what altitudes was the jet stream at this day? Well, you can pretty much see that very clearly 
from this data and the comparable stuff on the descent, it was somewhere between about 35,000 feet and about 50,000 feet. So by having the kids spend some time looking at their data after the flight, we always do this, there's actually a tremendous amount that they can actually learn around their STEM curriculum. And this is the part that makes the, the theory that we taught in the physics part of this real for the kids, so they've actually gone and measured it. Okay. Now, here's a piece I was telling you about the accuracy of the, um, of the predictor. This was the predicted path for HAB2, and this is the actual APRS data. Pretty close, right? Now, you can see we went longer than what this suggested. And part of that was we didn't have the weights and the helium quite right, so we didn't rise as fast as we had predicted. But had we had things calibrated right to a burst here, this thing would have been dead on, pretty darn close to it. So, you, so not good enough where you can you know, go wait at Waterboro or whatever and catch your hab as it comes down, but good enough if you're worried about where the thing is going to go and you want to stay out of trouble that you can you know, use it for that. Okay. And of course, this also makes great discussion in the classroom of why did it go longer and why did it take longer and what really happened there. If you do a good job of teaching the base material, you know, your kids will be able, especially the high school kids, will be able to answer some of those questions. Um, so I mentioned extremely low temperatures. And uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we're dealing with that. In the true spirit of lightweight, we came up with a very simple solution. We went to Home Depot and got some, I don't know, what is that really thin stuff, R11 or something insulation. You know, stuff that's about a quarter inch thick. And we made these NASA approved camera insulators and we fixed them up with some duct tape. And uh, that was good enough for us to capture our first burst at high altitude. So we swung through another one of the actually colder than this. We were actually below minus 80. And one of the two cameras stayed on. Now we're still losing too much heat out the bottom and the front. So for our next one, we're gonna come up with something that covers those areas as well. And you can see we have the official NASA approved heating system here. If you all lived in New England, you would know all about hand warmers. <laughs> So we put a couple of those in the back here and we put them in right before the launch so we don't overheat the cameras. Although if you look at the temperature data, it doesn't take long to get in the cold here. So as long as we don't let the thing sit around in the sun, you know, for very long before we launch it, um, this works out quite well. And we only add, we add less than 100 grams to the whole deal by doing this. So here's a picture of the HAB that's ready to launch. Um, you can see the cameras are on here. We have one that looks out. And that we use to see the ground. And we have one that looks up to see the balloon when it bursts. And also so the kids can see how it grows. Here's the flight computer. Um, the APRS transfer, you can just barely see a little bit of the dipole here. It's hanging down. Um, I'm sorry, it's hanging down over here, excuse me. That's the battery connection. And then this is the pressure and temperature sensor. And there's the commercial satellite GPS tracker that's our backup. You can see we got our floats taped on. We're ready to fly. Okay. So there's two things that you need to fly HABs in New England. And we've used them both extensively. You need a tree climber and you need a boat. Uh, we got a lot of woods up here and uh, HAB 1, HAB 3, and HAB 4 all ended up in trees. The first one went in Connecticut and the homeowner heard the beeper and got so excited he went out and cut his own tree down <laughs> to see what the NSA had set. And, and, uh, and the balloon had my phone number on, my cell phone number, which is a good thing to do. And so he calls me up and he's wondering like, are you like with the government? <laughs> because this thing just landed in my tree. Um, the second one went swimming in a pond in Maine. And that's when we learned that we need to take the flotation devices on. You can see here's one that kind of came off on the landing. And of course, our other guy that does this, Jamie, has a kayak, which we take to every single HAB launch. The third one, which I don't have a video because it's so unsafe, I'm afraid to show it. Curtis climbed a 75 foot tree to fish this puppy out. And it took him a better part of two hours. Now he wears a GoPro camera 
And the best part of this is, is we live stream all this. So we're sitting in my living room at home after track of this thing, watch Curtis go up the 75 foot tree, praying that he doesn't fall. But that's all kind of part of the excitement of us doing this. So whenever we can, we live stream the flight, you know, because the stuff goes to APRS as it flies, you see the path um, created as the balloon flies. And all in all, it makes for a pretty amazing uh, a deal. And you definitely do want to capture video, not only from the balloon, but what's going on on the ground too. And if you set it up right, your students, you, you may not want them out trekking around, trying to chase this thing down. Like, you know, some of these things end up in forests where we got to hike a little bit and stuff. So we generally don't encourage the kids to go do that. And if they do, we insist that their parents are there. But the fact that the people that are doing it are carrying cameras, kind of allows the kids to see what's going on without them putting them at risk. So we kind of come to the end of the basic part. What I, I've got now is a couple videos I'm going to show you. The first one, we make a video after every flat we do. And then we also kind of have a uh, best of where we put all the pieces, highlights together from all of our half flights into one video that kind of makes it look like everything goes perfect every time. So the first video I'm going to show you is a composite of Habs 1, 2, 3, and 4 that shows the kids doing the preparation on the ground, the launch, a really nice ascent on Hab 1 where we had a, a lot of clouds where you could kind of really see, get a gauge of how high you were. You're going to see um, the burst um, from actually Hab 4, and then you're going to see some descent video and uh, sort of covering Hab 2 out of the pond in Maine. And then I'm also going to show you HAB 3, which is an end-to-end -end flight video of one of our HABs. Now, on this one, it's the one where the camera shut off. And one of the unique things about the second video is you can use that APRS data in Google Earth to simulate what you would have seen on the ground at altitude if the camera had stayed on. So I'm going to show you that little trick as well. And that's kind of a fun thing to do anyway, because there's some stuff you can see that you can't see the other way. So at any rate, let's do the composite one first. By the way, this is um, HAB, I think this was HAB 2 or 3. Yeah, this was HAB 3, I believe. And there are actually two schools involved in this particular launch here. And there's the teacher holding the balloon out right before the launch with the kids. So at any rate, here's the video. So here's the kids scrapping the platform for launch. There's the two meter transmitter in the dive hall. And uh, we found two kids who could actually tie a bow line. So they're rigging the flight line. We bring that go kid out and do a ground test on the telemetry. They inflate the balloon, and you notice they have the official uh, NASA-approved balloon handling gloves that they're all wearing. And this is the hair-wracking, or nerve-wracking part, because you got to not let the balloon go when you're kicked with this tape enough. Everything's ready to go. They're ready to launch. Now, the upper right here is the uplifting camera. Uplooking camera after launch, and the one that you're seeing here is the outlooking camera. So here we go. There it goes. The looking up camera now is what the camera that's looking up on the hat is seeing. Look, note how small the balloon looks. So they're ready to go back. You'll end up with some amazing video from these deals. It's kind of fun. There we all are watching the balloon disappear. Hoping that we see it again.
Now, typically, what we'll do is we'll time lapse these things and overlay the data from the computer so you get some sense of what's going on at different altitudes here. Temperature drops pretty fast. We're already down below freezing, and the day we launched out was pretty warm, like 60 some degrees, I think. We've also lost about a quarter of the pressure relative to the ground. If you did a transatlantic flight, you might see something out looking like this, looking out the air window of an airplane. Probably haven't been these high unless you're maybe a military pilot. And unless you fly spy planes, you haven't been up here. <laughs> now you'll notice the temperature or through the tropo phase is going to start to go up again. Note how much bigger the balloon looks now. It's already grown quite a bit because the pressure is, is only a fraction, maybe, I don't know, probably 10 to be percent or less of what ground was. Yeah, 5% already. We're higher than I thought. You can also see the blackest space pretty good at this altitude. Here it actually, you can convince yourself in, you are in space. You're actually in the stratosphere. But the temperature is almost back up to zero degrees again. Now, on these real high altitude flights, we typically see temp pressures at about a tenth of a percent of ground, so we get up into some pretty thin air. The balloon has grown tremendously. It's quite a bit bigger than it was. And what's coming up here next is you're going to see it first. This is the balloon at 118,000, which is our last flight. It's just about to burst. There it goes. You can see how violent that release of energy is at this altitude and that's the, what the platform goes through. Also note, we don't have enough air to really open the parachute yet. Also, the sun's pretty bright, but you don't have any air. Here's a slow motion view. You can see the whole balloon just come apart. It took us four tries to actually, and all our camera installation actually captured this. We could probably push this maybe another 5,000 feet, but unless you sheath the balloon, you're almost at the limit of what's possible with an unsheathed weather balloon. And here's what it looks like. We're on our way down. We've got the parachute open. And uh, you can see we're back in the uh, troposphere. You can see why you worry about the, the balloon getting tangled up and stuff there. Um, this is some of the final APRS track on HAP2 where we came down to the pond and of course the flight path. And here we are in a pond of Maine. Here is the hat, and it looked like it hit a tree because there's a, you see some branches down there with it. All right. So I have one more video of HAB3 here. Um, and there's a couple unique things here that, that I'm going to share, and then we'll do some Q&A. So here goes HAB3. Now, this is all from this one flight. And this was the video that they, we made for the, uh, for the school. So this was a much bigger group. We, this was the one where we had the two schools. You can see the kids are all actively involved in inflating the balloon. They've all got their official gloves on so the oils in the balloon don't cause a premature burst or their hands don't cause a premature balloon burst. We're also going to run out of helium halfway through in this one tank, which is why you want to have two tanks available. You'll see us switching over to a different tank halfway through this. Thank <laughs> you. 
I don't think we've quite switched yet. We're just we're really going slow. We're we just about yeah. There we go. We're getting ready to switch over. Now we're on the second tank of cooking. We also had a guy out with a drone for this, which is how we got some of this aerial video. The thing that's unique about this launch is we had a perfectly clear day, which made for really nice video close to the ground. And the parents, I think, enjoy this as much as the kids do. There's the whole flight line laying on the ground. You can see it's a pretty big contraption. And of course, we picked the smallest teacher as the one to hold the balloon. She was scared to death. <laughs> So the thing you want to do when you launch is you need to keep the flight line taut so it doesn't tangle up. You can hear the uh, sounder there. It's on, of course. And that's what it looks like from the GoPro. Now, honestly, you'll get your nicest overall video on days when it's a little bit cloudier. The ground looks pretty boring when you can see it from 30,000 feet clearly, but it looks makes for really nice video when you're close to the ground like this. You can see why we have problems with trees here in New Hampshire. Okay. This flight was also pre-camera insulation, so we're going to lose the cameras pretty early here. But I'll show you what we replaced them with. The good news is the telemetry stayed on, and the HAB only went about 10 miles on this flight, so we actually recovered it locally, which is very unusual. The jet stream was completely quiescent on this particular day, which we've never seen before or since. And the other thing they do is they take a Fox Hunt antenna and a couple HTs because the APRS transmitter is still on, the, on on the ground. If you have to, you can Fox Hunt it. And so, you know, that's another thing that you can kind of use it when you talk to you, the students about, you know, if you say, hey, the way we're going to find this is radio direction finding. You bring in a couple HTs, you hide a fox, you take them out, you let them hunt the fox. It's just like they're hunting the have. So there's lots of good ways, again, to keep tying the amateur radio stuff into what you're doing here. And by the time you're done, you know, if you do it right, you'll have five or six kids that are dying to get a license.